to see so many people turned out uh, after having just been here a scant uh, year ago. I'm delighted that they invited me back. Uh, the deal is no jokes about Camaro raffles, no jokes about Moldavite suppositories. <laughs> so just consider it as if it didn't happen. <laughs> no, it, it's, it is a pleasure to be here. I'm fascinated by this green and intelligent part of Texas. Uh, I grew up with all the prejudices against Texas that you have in western Colorado, where Texans arrive to kill our elk once a year and then depart and leave us once again bereft of glory and drawl. So, so uh, I, I did a radio show, some of you may have heard it, uh, and it was an occasion to be up at the campus. Wonderful university. I see a lot of universities and a lot of them look like Air Force bases and uh, you're very fortunate to have the University of Texas at Austin. There are some great people associated uh, with that faculty. Okay, let me get a wet whistle here. How many people have read uh, at least one of my books? A lot of people. Well, so what I'm thinking is uh, I have some things on my mind, and I'll run through that, but I'd like to leave a lot of time for Q&A because my thing has several facets, and maybe you're interested in Salvia Divinorum, and I'm raving on about modeling and animation, or maybe you're interested in the end of history, and I can't shut up about serotonin metabolism. So this is all part of the picture, but driven by your needs and your agenda, I think it's much more uh, fruitful. It's much more fun for me. The audiences in these things are, uh, are the great joy. And, and I should say to you, as I say to all my audiences, uh, the psychedelic community is still uh, small and tight. And we look pretty much like everybody else out there. That's part of our victory, I might point out. It's not that we came to look like them. It's that they finally let it down, and now they all look like us. Uh, but a gathering like this is an occasion to actually see your local psychedelic community. So take a look around. Somebody in this room has what you need. And uh, it's like an intelligence test, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> all social interaction is, it, it turns out. Okay. I guess I should bring you up to date on what I've been doing before I plunge into the heart of this, since uh, I guess my own life is my own adventure and how I then read the larger picture of reality. I think everybody sees their their life that way. After all, if you're not the hero in your novel, uh, what kind of novel is it? You need to do some heavy editing. Uh, Robert Anton Wilson once said, he said, uh, we should define reality as a plot run by a closely knit group of powerful insiders, yourself and your friends, of course. I mean, if you don't believe that, you have a loser's scenario, and who needs a loser's uh, scenario? So what I've been doing since I saw you last uh, is basically a lot of traveling. I went uh, to South Africa last October, and that was an education. It was a nonstop two-week intensive education in humanness, third world colonial politics, Dutch Afrikaner history, a whole bunch of things I knew very little about. Uh, it, it was inspiring, challenging, amazing. Africa, the human home, is right now the great theater of struggle for the human soul. How we deal with the political and social problems of Africa 
is going to say a great deal about how we will be judged by the future. The problems of Africa are almost entirely created from outside of Africa. And uh, the solutions which are being produced on native soil need uh, all the nurturing and support that we who, who cheer on the brotherhood of man can uh, give it. And then in February, I went to Australia. And if I had known about Australia what I know now, 30 years ago, I'm sure my life would be very different. I said last night at a book signing, it's weirdly like Texas. I mean, it's large, it's largely empty, and uh, it has a very eccentric population of hard-driving folks. Uh, who, who are lovely to party with and know how to barbecue. So, uh, <laughs> what more can I say? Okay, so enough with personal repertage, local color, putting us all at ease and all the rest of that forensic malarkey. <laughs> Cut to the chase. When I think about talking to an audience like this, I go through my toolkit and try to say, you know, what is cogent, what's meaningful, what can bring us forward? And there seem to be, it's a changing list, but at the moment what seems to be going is the old perennial psychedelic alteration of consciousness for purposes of personal exploration social reformation, creation of a new art, a new politic. That's one of the, of the major pieces of the puzzle. Another major piece is uh, the new communications technologies. And I mean not only the internet, but the software that allows us, each and every one of us, to be animators, filmmakers, visually expressive people who can produce emotionally moving works of great depth and beauty. This is something that technology has brought to us. And strangely enough, a technology largely produced by psychedelic heads, people like ourselves. I told you last year, I think, when we discussed drugs and technology, that the only difference between a computer and a psychedelic was one was too large to swallow. Well, you know, great progress has been made in 12 months. Uh, in another th three or four years, we will be able to swallow the computer. Some of us may never be able to swallow it. Uh, the third piece of the puzzle, which is sort of mine alone to play with, since no one else wants to be this publicly crazy, is uh, the whole business of novelty theory, the approach of a singularity in time that is sculpting the human and natural world, and that is so large an object in the intuitive sphere of human beings that it almost has religious overtones. And then the question for me and the question for you, I suppose, is how much of this can you take without having to take it all? How much of these ideas can you imbibe without having to go uh, the whole distance? And the answer is, you know, it's a personal matter for each person to feel into their circumstance, which means their history, both psychedelic and non-psychedelic, and then to feel into the projection of their future. Do you think you are repeating the lifestyles and algorithms of your parents and grandparents ad infinitum back to Adam? Or do you feel like you've stepped to the front of the train of human evolution? that you are making yourself new every day. If we reach too far back into the stabilizing metaphors of the past, we get rigidity, habit, limitation. If we step too quickly into the unlimited freedom of the future, we lose our grounding. 
uh, socialism did this over the past hundred years and because it abandoned any contact with a realistic human psychology the best intended people ended up creating nightmare societies if your theory is not true to the nature of humanness you will end up beating human beings like metal on the anvil of your ideology and this creates great human suffering and uh, and uh, historical catastrophe and I maintain that our own society suffers from an, a, a failure to adequately model and reflect the true nature of human beings we have ideas we have ideals that get in the way of realism and immediate experience and when I was thinking about all of this and tr how to put it into a metaphor that would be appealing and amusing and, and lead people to look deeper into these things uh, I began to play with the idea uh, it's a religious idea uh, you all have heard although probably more often in English than in Latin the thought in principio et verbum et verbo caro factum est which means in the beginning was the word and the word was made flesh this is the great overarching myth of Western religion it equally informs Islam Christianity Judaism these three great flavors of monotheism all accept this primary statement in the beginning was the word and the word was made flesh what does it mean for a moment taken away from the tired exegesis of the cults that have hammered at it for so long what does it mean in and of itself it means that language is somehow the privileged medium of exchange between human beings and the divine that the descent of the word into flesh makes the flesh more than flesh makes the word more than the word the union of flesh and word launches the cosmic drama of fall and redemption that is the Ur myth of Western society and for centuries and centuries we've concentrated on one end of this story of the fall and the redemption we have concentrated on the fall but meanwhile through all the grimy betrayals and bloody backsliding of human history the word has quietly advanced its agenda and I've been thinking a lot about this recently because in the new book I'm writing I'm writing a lot about spoken language speech and I've come to a conclusion that typical of me is far from orthodoxy and far from much cover provided by anybody else's ideas on this matter I've come to the conclusion that language is very old thinking is very old communicating is very old by glance by gesture by dance by meme by intuition but speech is very recent it's a technological innovation as fresh as uh, the Pentium chip or the spinning wheel it's something someone invented somewhere it's the most successful technological leap forward ever made it's the discovery of symbolic signification that a noise meaning nothing can by convention be given a meaning and that that meaning will then attend that utterance wherever it occurs in the presence of those who have joined in the agreement that attaches the symbol to the meaningless utterance it's a coding breakthrough 
Somebody hacked this about 35,000 years ago. And immediately, as forms of media have a way of doing, it swamped the previous methods of communication because, A, it worked in the dark. Uh, suddenly, uh, evenings were not so boring anymore. Uh, it worked in the dark. It also, the touchy-feely forms of communication were generally one-on-one -on -one and related probably to having sex or aggressive physical encounters. But suddenly, one voice could reach many, and many could respond. And Virtual reality was born at that moment, not here in the late 20th century, but at that moment, because acoustical environments laden with symbolic meaning became the name of the game. Stories is what we call these things, and they are uh, the proper use of the advanced form of media known as human speech. It's using human speech to create three-dimensional scenarios that unfold and everyone is carried along with the drama and the wonder of it. From that beginning, and in a series of successively accelerating leaps, the word has made its way into the world. Uh, it's interesting that uh, straight linguists and paleolinguists believe human language is no more than 35,000 years old. Imagine that. We possess Homo sapiens sapiens skeletons 110,000 years old. People like the person who rode with you on the bus yesterday. People that modern. And yet the experts tell us no one spoke until 35,000 years ago. N no one wrote until five or six thousand years ago. Reading and writing is simply a carrying forward of the original program of signification, first using acoustical signals, and then some other hacker had the brilliant idea, well, if we can use sound to carry abstract associations, why not abstract symbols? to carry abstract associations. And writing was born. And what writing allows is expansion of the database because things are not dependent on the, the wetware of human memory to survive from generation to generation. Suddenly, the mush of brain is replaced by the durability of wood and stone and clay. And these things then become the medium upon which the primary database of the culture is being carried forward. Well, the rest of the story you know, and this is not a lecture in the history of communication. Each succeeding refinement in communication has brought the word deeper into its association with the flesh until the present. And at this moment, there is a kind of a uh, what dynamicists call a cusp, a turning of the system upon its axes. And the word is now beginning to make the return journey to the mysterious and hidden source from which it descended. In other words, spirit is now beginning to disentangle itself from matter. The 20th century will be remembered as the great clash point or the great arena of conflict between the triumphal positivist and rational systems that European thought has developed over the past 300 years and the new irrational systems of thought which anthropology cheerfully imported into white high culture in the guise of reportage about the primitive. But this reportage about the primitive turns out to be a kind of ouroboric conundrum, the snake taking its tail in its mouth. 
in the past hundred years, as these super technologies have been developed in the West, the smashing of atoms, the invention of, of radio, television, computers, immunology, so forth and so on, data has been arriving about the practices of aboriginal cultures all over the planet, that they dissolve ordinary realities, ordinary cultural values, through an interaction, a symbiosis, a relationship to local plants that perturb brain chemistry. And in this domain of perturbed brain chemistry, the cultural operating system is wiped clean. And something older, even for these people, something older, more vitalistic, more in touch with the animal soul, replaces it, replaces the cultural operating system, something not determined by history and geography, but something writ in the language of the flesh itself. This is who you are. This is true nakedness. You are not naked when you take off your clothes. You still wear your religious assumptions, your prejudices, your fears, your illusions, your delusions. When you shed the cultural operating system, then, essentially, you stand naked before the inspection of your own psyche. Desmond Morris called it the naked ape. And it's from that position, a position outside the cultural operating system, that we can begin to ask real questions about what does it mean to be human, what kind of circumstance are we caught in, and what kind of structures, if any, can we put in place to assuage the pain and accentuate the glory and the wonder that lurks waiting for us in this very narrow slice of time between the birth canal and the yawning grave? In other words, we have to return to first premises. So I've been thinking about this a lot, and at first it seemed to me only a metaphor this phrase, culture is your operating system. But because I travel around a lot and get that jolting experience frequently of, let's say, leaving London on a foggy evening and arriving in Johannesburg 14 hours later to a sweltering day in a city of 14 million on the brink of anarchy, I get to change my operating system frequently. And so I notice the relativity of these systems. And some work for some things and some for others. For instance, if you are a positivist, if you're running positivism 4.0, you can't support UFOs. Positivism 4.0 does not support UFOs. If, on the other hand, you're running your Rancha book 5.1 as your operating system, uh, UFOs and a number of other things can get in through the door. That is what we would technically say is a more tolerant operating system. Or its plug-ins support special effects denied the positivist. Well, uh, it's fun to think this way because it shows you that you're, you don't have to be the victim of your culture. It's not like your eye color or your height or your gender. Uh, it's, it's fragile. It can be remade if you wish it to be. And then the question is, well, how, do, how does one uh, uh, download a new operating system? Well, first of all, you have to clear some space on your disk. Uh, the best way to do this is probably with a pharmacological agent. Um, you think of some while I have a drink of water. Psilocybin is an excellent disc cleaner. Uh, you can put a lot of things in the trash and have them just disappear uh, with a uh, psilocybin upgrade. Uh, uh, other pharmacological agents that will clear your disc are uh, ayahuasca. 
And of course, these are gentle clearings of the disc, which take five, six, seven hours. Uh, if you're in a hurry to dump that old data and leap right into the new operating system, uh, click on the button marked dimethyltryptamine. Uh, a compressed disk erasure will immediately be downloaded, unstuffed, bin hexed, implemented, installed, run, and, uh, and you will find yourself with an entirely different head. Um, now, shamans have always known, though they may not have used the kind of language I'm using here, shamans have always known this trick. What trick? It has two facets. First of all, that culture is an operating system, that's all it is, and that the operating system can be wiped out and replaced by something else. So, in essentially, what's going on among shamans and those who resort to them uh, for curing and, and counseling and so forth is somebody's running a slightly more advanced operating system than the customer. Uh, the, the shaman is in possession of certain facts about plants, about animals, about healing, about human psychology, about the local geography, about mojo of many different sorts that the client is not aware of. The client is running culture light. The shaman paid for the registered and licensed version of the software and uh, is running a much heavier version of the software than the client. I think we should all aspire to make this upgrade. Uh, it's very important that you have all the bells and whistles uh, on your operating system. Otherwise, somebody is going to be able to get a leg up uh, on you. Well, what's wrong with the operating system that we have? Uh, consumer capitalism 5.0 or whatever it is. Well, it's dumb. Uh, it's retro. It's very non-competitive. It's messy. It wastes the environment. It wastes human resources. Uh, it's inefficient. It runs on stereotypes. It runs on a low sampling rate, which is what creates stereotypes. Low sample rates uh, make uh, everybody appear alike, when in fact the glory is in everyone's differences. Uh, and the current operating system uh, is flawed. It actually has bugs in it uh, that generate contradictions. Contradictions such as we're cutting the earth from beneath our own feet. We're poisoning the atmosphere that we breathe. This is not intelligent behavior. This is a culture with a bug in its operating system that's making it produce erratic, dysfunctional, malfunctional behavior. Time to call a tech. And who are the techs? The shamans are the techs. Well, so I think you get the idea. Uh, very important to upgrade your operating system by dumping obsolete cultural subroutines. They are simply taking up disk space. They are not advancing uh, you in any way whatsoever. Now, a very large group of people who followed this advice and rebuilt their operating systems in the 1960s went on then to build this most amazing of all cultural artifacts, the Internet. The Internet is light at the end of the tunnel. I don't care if it's being used to peddle pornography. I don't care if it's being trivialized in a thousand ways. Anything can be trivialized. The important point is that it is leveling the playing field of global society. It is creating de facto an entirely new set of political realities. None of the constipated oligarchic structures that are resisting this were ever asked. 
their greed betrayed them into investing in this in the first place without ever fully grasping what the implications of it were for their larger agenda. The internet basically means you can now be as, as free as you are motivated to be, as free as you dare to be. Uh, Tim Leary years ago, it was something he used to say that never got quoted as much as turn on, tune in, drop out, but it seemed to me it, it was maybe better advice. And he used to say, find the others. Find the others. Well, you know, if you're a gay kid in Fargo, North Dakota, if you're a mescaline enthusiast in Winnipeg, if you're a student of alchemy in Moose Jaw, it, community is pretty much out of reach uh, for you. Or it was until the coming of the Internet. And the Internet introduces everybody, no matter how weird, no matter how marginalized, no matter how peculiar, to the fact that there are others like you. There are others like you. Find the others. Make common cause. Uh, realize that uh, it's the deals you cut and the friends you make that determine where you're going to be standing when the flash hits. I mean, that's just obvious. And by, you see, the cultural game is a game of uniformitarianism. Cultural myths are that we are all alike. We Americans, each created equal. I mean, if you can believe that, at an operational level, then I have some bridges I would like to sell you. Uh, it, it's a necessary truth to do political business, but it is not the truth. The truth is that you are not created equal with yourself from day to day. Leave alone any comparison with anybody else. You are not the person you were yesterday nor the person you will be next week. What is an observation like that? Uh, what shadow does it cast in a world of all people are created equal? Uh, these are clashes of operating systems. There's an axiom in one, all created equal, and an axiom in the other, each divergent. These things can't be parsed. They can't be brought together. So culture plays a game of simplification. If you can make people think alike, they will buy alike, they will worship alike, and if, you know, politics demands it, they will kill alike. So the uniformitarian agenda of culture is not an agenda friendly to you or to me or to any other individual. And if you start out from that point of view, you will soon realize that culture is not your friend. Now, this is not exactly PC to say, what with everybody running around recovering their Latvian roots and their Irishness and their this, their whatever. Culture is not your friend. If you define yourself as a member of a group of any group, know that that is a gross simplification and that everything about you that is interesting and unique is betrayed by defining yourself in that way. Uh, you know, most racism is practiced by people of the race that they are making racial judgments about. White people have far more racial opinions about white people than any other racial group because that's where they spend their time. These gross simplifications betray humanity, betray uniqueness, make sane politics impossible. What we have to do is get back to the reality of the flesh, the reality of the individual identity. This is how we come packaged. Uh, a race, that's an abstraction. 
These days, you have to have three years of genetics under your belt to give a satisfactory definition of the word if we're really going to go to the math on it. I mean, it's an, it's, an, it's an abstraction of modern science. It's a notion so far removed from anything you and I come in contact with that we should just junk it. What we need to celebrate is the individual. It's, have you not noticed, I certainly have, that every historical change you can think of, in fact, any change you can think of, forget about human beings, any change in any system that you can think of is always ultimately traceable to one unit in the system undergoing a phase state change of some sort. No group, there are no group decisions. Those things come later. The genius of creativity and of initiation of activity always lies uh, with the individual. And it's very interesting that this is what the psychedelics address. They address us uniquely as individuals. You can sit next to somebody who drank from the same bottle you did and be perfectly confident that their experience has very little congruency uh, with your own. Well, so then if we, if we um, let the scales of cultural values fall from our eyes and try not to look at the world through the eyes of science or democracy or capitalism or Christianity, what, what is there beyond ideology? What are the facts of the matter? As I see it, uh, the most visible facts on the, on the surface of things, on the surface of being, I see the law of increasing complexity. Things have gotten more complicated through time. I, I have never met anyone who could successfully argue against this. That doesn't mean it's true, but it means that it may be, as Wittgenstein used to say, true enough, true enough, that as you approach the present moment in the only area of the universe which we have accurate data about, which is this planet, things, have, things become more complicated. Uh, a million years ago, there were no human civilizations. A thousand years ago, there were no machines to speak of. A hundred years ago, there was no communication infrastructure to speak of. Ten years ago, there was no internet. Eighteen months ago, there was no Java. Uh, things are complexifying, intensifying, moving together. This is the universal drama that is reaching culmination in our lifetimes. Because, and I offer this don't believe me, for God's sake. Don't believe anybody. Just take this stuff in and then measure it against your own experience. The second extracultural fact that I've been able to discern, the first being things get more complicated as you approach the present, and the second being that process of complexification is occurring faster and faster. The early universe was very slow moving. It took a long time for things to cool down and life to begin its agonizing march out of the slime into animal form, meeting extinction and catastrophe and setback after setback, but always picking itself up literally out of the mud and moving forward. Well, as life left the ocean, the pace of evolution quickened. As life radiated across the land, uh, the number of, of phyla multiplied, the number of species multiplied. Finally, a million years ago, pick a number, a million and a half years ago, the higher primates begin to use tools. Fire enters the picture. And just as an aside, isn't it interesting how long people used tools and fire before spoken language enters the picture? I mean, we possess tools a million years old, human tools. 
language 35,000 years old. When I was in South Africa last year, I was in this place that reminded me of like the Four Corners area around Moab, Utah. It was like nothing like I had expected South Africa to be. And when I wasn't teaching, I would wander the dry arroyos and hunt for human tools. And there was an archaeologist staying in the bar or in the hotel there, and we would drink in the evening in the bar. And I would lay my day's find out on the bar, and he would sort it into piles. And he'd say, nothing in this pile is less than 165,000 years old. Everything in this pile is from human tools we're talking about. Now I've lost my thread because I was so thrilled with my sidebar. Uh, I think I can get it back. Ah, oh, yeah, here it is. Here it is. <laughs> and they say potheads can't think. <clears throat> here it is. The, the second obvious fact which haunts the post-cultural viewpoint is this acceleration of change. And I've sort of built my career on this because I'm a rationalist, but I feel the emotional power of this thing. We are, in, we are caught in a basin of attraction, to use a mathematical term. In other words, we are under the influence of something which is pulling us into the future or into novelty, if you want to put it that way, at a faster and faster rate. So problems which are presented in the following terms, if we don't do something in 500 years, we will run out of this, that, or the other. Or if we don't do something in a thousand years, this or that will happen. These are meaningless statistics because the uh, acceleration into novelty is rewriting the rules now every 18 months. Uh, we, we are descending now into a well of novelty such that more change is now occurring in a single human lifetime than occurred in the previous 10,000 years of human history. We are approaching at a faster and faster rate something unthinkable, something which is sculpting us in its image, something which shamans have always known was there, though they may not have used the metaphor of ahead of us in time. That's a Western download of where it is, because you could just as well say it's in heaven, or behind us in time, or everywhere, or nowhere. The point is, we're about to arrive in its presence, and uh, it is shaping us to prepare us for the arrival. It is making us more and more in its image. This is not a new process. This began a long, long time ago, but it's now reaching its culmination. And I said a few minutes ago, the Internet is light at the end of the tunnel. The Internet is the beginning of a nervous system that is knitting not only all human beings, but all life together, all information together. Because, you know, there already is an Internet. It's called the Integrated Ecosystem of Planet 3. It runs on pheromones. It runs on weather systems, ocean tides, telluric currents moving in the Earth, uh, thousands of methods. Give it that way because our cultural tradition is one of reductionism, tear things apart break them into their subordinate units, break those into still smaller units. Well, when you have a theory of reality like that, what you end up with is all the pieces spread out and no car and nowhere to go. Uh, but nature has always operated as an integrated system of communication. And the Internet is, in a sense, uh, nothing more than a human aping of a natural system already in place. If we could do it through pheromones, light, mycelium, and electromagnetic pulses through the earth, we wouldn't be stringing copper and cable and fiber optic. Those things are simply um, historical artifacts of the moment. What lies ahead on the internet, what lies ahead, I think, for us, and this is the last point I really want to make, and then we can talk about all this, 
is, you know, I have been a true resistor of the alien penetration of human civilization because I just saw no evidence for it. But the, the chant that they are coming has now grown so loud that I feel like one sort of has to ask oneself, well, short of just 100% skepticism, what the hell is going on with this alien hype? And I think that the problem is one of modeling and intelligence. There is an alien. We are in the cultural process of meeting this alien, but they do not come in thousand-ton beryllium ships from Zanebo Ganubi to trade high technology for human fetal tissue. I mean, that, if you, that's an intelligence test, folks. Uh, that's not how it works. Uh, our own hysteria makes it very difficult for us to deal with the presence of the alien, and the alien knows that. That's why it has disguised itself as a psychedelic experience, I think. Uh, where You know how in all those 50s B science fiction movies the, there was always this theme of the landing area? And I saw it in Mars Attacks, too. There must be a landing zone. Somehow we must let them know that we welcome them by building a landing area and the Nazca Plain has been claimed, and on and on and on. I think that the alien is a creature of pure information. It's purely information. It's non-local. It comes out of the Bell non-locality part of the universe that exists distributed through hyperspace. The alien is real, but it is only made of information, and therefore the only dimension in which it can be encountered is a dimension of pure information. Fortunately, we are building a dimension of pure information. Providentially, we have named it the net. The net is a net for catching the alien mind. How will it come? Will it descend upon our websites in a flash of light? I don't think so. How it will come is hacked through human fingers. The alien is real, but it is within us. It can only communicate information, and that information has to be made real in this world by human coders. So if we were to set out lightheartedly to build a virtual reality as alien as we could make it, I maintain that three quarters of the way our hair would be standing on end because we would realize we are not inventing this. We are discovering it. You know, Michelangelo said, uh, the form is in the block of marble. What I do is I take away the part that is unnecessary and reveal the human torso within the block of marble. In the same way, the alien is already within us, but we must model it. We must call it forth into a dimension of potential dialogue. And I think that ultimately this is what high-tech society can bring to the shamanic equation. Uh, Shamans have been dealing with spirits, entities, powers for more than 100,000 years. But it has always been on a one-to-one -one basis. One human being at a time went up Mount Sinai to talk to the fire on the mountain. But with virtual reality, we have a technology that allows us to show each other our dreams and, yes, our hallucinations. And as we begin to show each other the contents of our own heads, and as we begin to explore the alien Niagara's of beauty that pour through your consciousness under the influence of some of these substances, we are going to discover that we are not what we thought we were. The, the monkey flesh is penetrated 
by something, dare I say it, divine, or at least alien, transplanetary, and beyond the power of human comprehension. I don't know if we're talking about God Almighty here. I don't know if we're talking about the God who hung the stars like lamps in heaven, as Milton says. That seems a tall order. Maybe what we're talking about is the God of biology. Uh, something has happened to this planet. It has become infected with an informational, call it virus, call it force, call it being, that is using matter and, yes, using our flesh and our thoughts to bootstrap itself to higher and higher levels. And now the prosthesis of machinery and the possibility of an artificial intelligence raises the real option of producing, of actually midwifing the birth of an entirely new not species, but order of biological and intelligence in existence. The human machine symbiote is upon us. I mean, it's been with us for a while, since the first wheel was carved, since the first stick was sharpened. But that was all very simple stuff. Now it's clear that we are in partnership with an other mind which comes to us through our machineries and through the biosphere. Wherever we press beyond the thin curtain of rationalist culture, we discover the incredibly rich, erotic, scary, promising presence of this intelligent other, which beckons us out of history and says, you know, the galaxy lies waiting. A galaxy of galaxies lie waiting. Lose the encumbrances of three-dimensional space. Return with the word to its higher and hidden source. And at that point, you will discover the alchemical uh, 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 paraclete will be given unto you. The alchemical dispensation will be given. And as James Joyce said, man will be dirgeable. <laughs> what did he mean? <laughs> he, he meant that we will lose the limitations of physical and three-dimensional space, that we are destined to become mental creatures. People say, well, isn't this a terrible thing? What about this, that, and the other? All the things you're worrying about, we turned our back on 25,000 years ago. We have been marching through this virtual reality of our own creation for the entire duration of what is called human history. Now, uh, is there a political implication to all of this? I think the political implication is a, a personal one, we all must try to understand what is happening. We need to try to understand what is happening. And in my humble opinion, ideology is only going to get in your way. Nobody understands what is happening. Not Buddhists, not Christians, not government scientists, not, you know, no one understands what is happening. So. Forget ideologies. They betray. They limit. They lead astray. Just deal with the raw data and trust yourself. Nobody is smarter than you are. And what if they are? What good is their understanding doing you? People who walk around saying, well, I don't understand quantum physics, but somewhere somebody understands it. That's not a very helpful attitude toward preserving the insights of quantum physics. Inform yourself. What does inform yourself mean? It means A, transcend and mistrust ideology. Go for direct experience. What do you think when you face the waterfall? What do you think when you have sex? What do you think when you take psilocybin? Everything else is unconfirmable rumor, useless, probably lies. So liberate yourself 
from the illusion of culture. Take responsibility for what you think and what you do. And then the other political implication toward community is a lot of people are going to be very anxious because change raises anxiety in people. And people who have limited opportunities to educate themselves because of cultural, culturally inflicted abuse are scared because they can sense that everything familiar is giving way, but they don't want to embrace the unimaginable. These people need to be reassured. They need to be reassured by example and by hearing optimistic and reasonable rhetoric about the future. Selling the future as an eight alarm fire, which is how the media does it, uh, only makes the same future impossible. So we need a responsible approach to thinking about the future. And it means taking personal responsibility for your drug taking, for the ideas, the means that you push into society, and for the images that we share among ourselves. You know, one of the great truisms of the New Age is that images can heal. But I've never heard anybody discuss the obvious contra implication, which is images can make you sick and you are constantly bombarded with images which disempower, divide, confuse, and, and, and make crazy, basically. So I think the reason psychedelics are such political dynamite in any culture is because they dissolve cultural assumptions. The scales fall from people's eyes and they say, does this make sense? Does my job make sense? Does my relationship make sense? to my significant other, to my government, to my children, to my environment. Do these relationships make sense? And of course, if the answer for most people in high-tech society is no. We've been compromised, we've been deluded, we've been sold a massive pottage. The way out then is personal responsibility, new operating systems downloaded from outside of culture, which means from the deeper wisdom of the psychedelic plants, and then a commitment to community and a motto of to the future without fear. Without fear. Thank you very much. Well, so much for a promise to be brief, uh, you know, you just wind the guy up and point him and uh, off he goes, uh, the robot who preaches freedom. <laughs> Questions, challenge, anything, anybody, yeah, you. Well, yeah, it's a tricky question because what's being maximized as things come together is novelty. And so then we have to have a discussion about what is novelty. To my mind, an explosion takes a complicated situation and reduces, or as mathematicians would say, flattens its dimensionality. Uh, uh, an art gallery or a beautiful home is far more interesting before an explosion than after. So I don't see how an, uh, some kind of catastrophe would entirely fulfill the bill. On the other hand, a partial catastrophe of some sort, because I believe primates are at their best when cornered. And we, don't, we aren't cornered yet. I mean, we talk about how we're cornered. People say, this is the end of the world. This ain't the end of the world. This is the long garden party before the end of the world, <laughs> with strolling musicians and superbly catered food and women in diaphanous gowns and high-toned conversation. Wait till you see the end of the world. It isn't about deciding to come up to Austin to attend the Whole Life Expo, let me tell you. So. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> yes, I should repeat questions. 
different part of the room, back here, white shirt, you, sir. This guy, yeah. Yes, you eloquently represent the position that language was invented in order to lie, right? Uh, well, that's what the second guy who got a hold of it, I'm sure, probably did with it. Uh, you're, you're right that I have an incredible enthusiasm for verbal speech, but it's only because it's easy for me to do. If, if I didn't do this, I'd have to find honest work. Uh, However, I, have, I am aware, or, yeah, I'm very aware of the limitations of language, and one of the things I've talked about a lot is what I call visible language. You used the example of telepathy, that if we were in telepathic communication, how could I lie? Because you would perceive my, my intent. Uh, the key to making language more true is to make it more visual. Uh, now, that can't just take the form of a bigger vocabulary and more colorful metaphors. Like people will say, when he spoke, he painted a picture. Or uh, listening to him was like watching a movie. I think ordinary speech goes through a series of stages from articulate to eloquent to poetic to demagogic, and uh, demagogic is where you want to be careful, uh, because then you can turn, you know, essentially Hitler turned history on its head with speeches. He just could really deliver a stem winder. Uh, I've been fascinated by the fact that in the Amazon, under the influence of ayahuasca, uh, people sing songs but they see the song they sing. And when you hear people talking about it afterwards, people will say, after listening to a song, you know, I love the part with the olive drab and the chrome, but I thought when he got into the magenta and yellow stripe thing, it was just too much. <laughs> well, this is a critique of a song? And then when you take ayahuasca with these people, you discover to your amazement that mm, is a blue ribbon a foot across that descends from floor to ceiling and has a yellow center and then mm, puts knobs in the ribbon and you can start singing and building, modeling, animating in three dimensions with sound. Well, I maintain that our insistence technologically on pushing our media toward ever more immediate sensation so that if we have photography it's black and white we demand color if it's color we demand motion if it's motion we demand sound if it's sound and motion we want 3d we it's that we trust our eyes and the natural uh domain of communication is visual for human beings we're like octopi in that way so really language needs to evolve toward the visual and that's why i'm very keen for technically dense prosthetic environments where every time you say the word and a yellow three-dimensional triangle appears in the air every time you say or an orange ball appears a computer is listening to what you're saying and giving a geometric accompaniment to speech i think that there are forms of telepathy that we can evolve through the use of drugs and computer-assisted technologies that will allow us to see each other's dreams. In spite of your correct assessment that I'm keen for the spoken word, I spend all summer learning 
modeling and three-dimensional animation programs from my son because I want to animate. I want to model. I see things on my trips that I have never been able to English, but that if I were a fully competent modeler and animator, I would just say, check it out. And I'm going to do that, and, and I urge you to do that. I mean, it's a funny thing to be told you want to spiritually advance, uh, study 3D animation. But these are the frontiers of communication. We have an obligation to make our language more immediate. It is the most godlike thing we do. If you're looking for the thumbprint of Almighty God on the biological organization of this planet, it is human language. It is a miracle. I don't give a hoot what the dolphins and the honeybees are out there in the woods doing. It ain't like Milton. It ain't even like Bob Dylan. Uh, it ain't even as good as this, I'm willing to say. Uh, no, human, human communication is what we are, and it will lead us to be a symbiotic species if we, if we put the pedal to the mantle. The, for people like yourselves, who I assume to be, no matter how you finagled your way in here this afternoon, part of the upper 3% of the ruling elite on this planet, there is a real obligation to use privilege to uh, communicate and to make art. I think this is what, if the good life has any purpose other than to drink beer and watch TV, it's to produce art. This is how you make a payback into the community. And art is ambiguous. Your art may say things to people other than yourself that it would never say to you. But that's how we make the community richer. That's how we enlarge the dimensions of the human soul, by, by making art. Yeah. Stand up and yell. Louder. You said, do you take psilocybin and see self-transforming machine elves? No. Yeah? The question is, when you encounter the self-transforming machine elves in hyperspace, do you think that's a reflection of ourselves, or do you think it's an alien, or, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but it's something like that. tricky because we are not what we think we are. Uh, I, 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 maybe I didn't spend enough time on this alien thing. Uh, I referred to non-local domains of information. This has to do with this idea in quantum physics that there is uh, something called Bell non-locality, that all particles that were ever associated, remain associated in some mysterious way, no matter how far apart in time and space they have drifted. Well, according to the Big Bang, all particles were once closely associated. At the, at the moment of the Big Bang, everything was in a space less than the diameter of the proton or some piddling distance like that. Uh, well, so then this was an idea that was just thought so outlandish that there could be this instantaneous dimension of connectivity that it was dismissed from quantum physics in favor of an acceptance of a somewhat less outlandish but equally challenging notion, which was the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And that's how it was left for about 40 years. And, but there were thought experiments that people talked about that could test for this Bell non-locality. Well, eventually, these apparatus were actually built, and these experiments were performed. And what do you know, Joe? 
Bell non-locality can be demonstrated the same way any other physical phenomenon can be demonstrated, given a sufficiently prepared laboratory situation. It's real. It's not woo-woo. It's actually scientifically true at the fundamental core of physics that all space and all time is in some form of simultaneous connection. Now, it gets a little dicey if you ask questions like, can we use this to get and send information? And I don't want to go into that because I think I already have the answer, no matter how good the arguments against it. I believe this is what the human imagination is. That you have two eyes to show you local space, and then you have an organ called the mind, which doesn't protrude anywhere on the surface of your body, except occasionally in some cases. Uh, it will lodge on a surrogate. But generally the mind is invisible, uh, but it gives you non-local data. That's what the imagination is. That's non-local data. Everything in the imagination is real somewhere. Somewhere so far away in space and time that it makes absolutely no sense to give it another thought ever again. Don't ever think that thought again. But know that everything in the imagination is real. So it's ridiculous to speak of my imagination or the human imagination. There is just the imagination. But see, if all information is there, 99.999% of that information is not intended for human beings and makes no sense whatsoever to us. It's basically static. It's either above or below our cognitive power to organize, and so it is meaningless. But 0.0000001% of this non-local data is enough like local data that we can make metaphoric bridges to it and say, well, it was like this, and it was sort of like this, and it was a kind of a this, and it reminded me of something else. And that's the stuff of the imagination. And to the degree that you can accept alien data without freaking out, you can go deeper into the imagination. I have a friend who says of psilocybin mushrooms, every time I take it, my goal is to stand more. And he doesn't mean stand more in terms of dosage. He means stand more in terms of content. Because it can always raise the bar higher than you can jump. I mean, I've had dialogues with it where after hours of dancing mice and personal revelations and kind of a sense of familiarity, I've said to it, well, but what are you really? Show me what you are for yourself. Well, my God, the temperature in the room begins to fall towards zero. Black draperies rise. There's an organ tone that shakes the earth. And after about 30 seconds, I say, hey, enough of what you are for yourself. Let's go back to the dancing mice and uh, the little candies rolling in the dark. And, uh, you know, it, it knows that you have a limited capacity to absorb its alienness. That's why we have what's called human history. Human history is the process of standing more. And it's now we've sort of come to the short and curly part of the process where they're just around the corner. I mean, all you have to do is smoke a doobie, look out at the evening sky, have a dream, talk to a friend, and the alien is very, very... It, it, it's trailing aura, or it's leading aura, I guess. It's, it's leading aura has now intersected uh, human psychology. But cheerful stories of space brothers and scary, silly stories of people trading high technology freaks in league with the government, hey, it's so much bigger than that. It's so big that it has disguised itself as an alien invasion to keep from really alarming us with what it really is. How are we doing here? Couple more questions. Uh, if you could come to the microphone for the tape recorder, you could pick it up. A lady, yes. Would you like to come up and to we'll get you on tape here? Yeah. 
I was just wondering what uh, you thought about the possibility of um, as we become more aware of what we're doing to the environment and the responsibility of those industrialized nations that are consuming more than their share, that uh, when we, if we could get on an equal playing field, then those uh, underdeveloped countries that have a great deal of the resources that they're using up to basically pay their national debt, uh, if they could receive technology so that they can be on an equal playing field on the internet, et cetera, in exchange for our consumption, that uh, it might be an interesting uh, evolution in terms of... Well, I, I think it's happening. In other words, uh, some people have objected that the internet and computers are an elitist technology in the hands of a bunch of white folks. Uh, to some degree, that's true, but on the other hand, if the automobile had followed the same curve of cost-benefit that the computer has followed in its development, then the average automobile today would cost uh, a buck and a half, and it would go 100,000 miles on 10 cents worth of gas. That's the kind of bang for your buck you're getting from the modern PC compared to where it was 35 years ago. No technology in history has had its costs fall so quickly. And there is no reason to think that those costs will level off. If a good PC today is $1,400, there's no reason why in five years it shouldn't be $140, and there's no reason why in 10 years it shouldn't be $14 and be worn on your thumbnail. This can all uh, be done. All, all these prices are artificially inflated. The other thing about the Internet is it, it is going wireless. Uh, and as it goes wireless, it goes totally global. If I can just brag for a minute and make an example of myself, I have a wireless connection to the Internet. At first, I got a wireless connection because I couldn't get any other kind because I lived way up on a volcano. But now, my wireless connection is one megabyte. That's 45 times faster than 28.8. The poor people down on copper... They can't do better than 56 because the infrastructure already exists and therefore limits the bandwidth. By going outside the infrastructure, this sounds like a reprise of my talk, by going outside the infrastructure and building a loan from ground up, I suddenly find myself looking down the gun barrel of a T1 connection, and it is heaven itself, let me tell you. And the people who sold it to me, and there must be dozens of other companies, uh, are bent on conquering the world, meaning putting everybody who wants to be online for pennies in the next five to six years. And, you know, if you live in Manhattan or even Austin, what is the Internet? It's another diversion. It's another piece of entertainment. It, but what is it like in Somalia, in Seychelles, in Bangalore? What kind of impact does it have there? It, it, it is, you talk about a culture-dissolving effect based on psychedelics. How about a culture-dissolving effect based on access uh, to the Internet? And people say, well, Western values will swamp all others. Uh, certainly, to some degree, that is true. But did that just begin yesterday? Isn't that what the bloody business has been about for 500 miserable years, ever since the barbarian Cortez arrived in Mexico? I think so. Well, don't get me off on that. Uh, uh, one last question. Who's just burning Anybody burning? There's somebody burning. So, where do you think we're going to be on December 22nd, 2012? All together. All together. <laughs> it's a nice answer. Here's another one. <laughs> Why have only one answer? <laughs> Uh, it's too early to tell. In other words, asking that question in 1997 is like asking a man looking east at 1 a.m. what he thinks the sunrise will be like. It's just too early. 
the sun lies over the event horizon of the planet. In other words, we can't see around the corner yet. In terms of our cultural, analogous cultural development, right now we've reached approximately the year 1000 AD. And between now and 2012, at an incredibly accelerated rate, we have to do a number of things. Discover the new world, invent the calculus, have the Renaissance, then have the Reformation, then have the Industrial Reformation, then have the 20th century. All that has to be squeezed into the next 14 years. Uh, the real outlines of what is tearing toward us will probably be uh, the province of squirrels and visionaries like myself until around 2004 and 5. And by that time, it will be clear to everyone what is on the end of every fork, as William Burroughs once said. In other words, it, it, it will be clear that history has been canceled. It will be clear that there is no human future except through hyperspatial breakthrough. We will all be walking around on an internet that is 90% VRML based and hence three-dimensional and interactive. And uh, nanotechnology will beginning, be beginning to deliver its goods to society. New forms of propulsion system are going to move the outer planets to within a few weeks travel, so forth and so on. Uh, so uh, we cannot at this moment know the true nature of the eschaton because at this moment if we knew the true nature of the eschaton it would shatter our cultural assumptions and our individual understanding completely. We have a lot of heavy lifting to do. There's a lot of self-education, hard tripping and heroic dosing that needs to be done before we can meet the eschaton on a level playing field. Be there or be square. Thank you. <laughs> How's that? Cool. Okay. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to see so many people here. Once again, this strange, magical moment when we come together again, or perhaps for the first time. You, having come from wherever you came from, me, having come from uh, the slopes of the world's largest active volcano, actually, but via Manhattan and Austin last uh, weekend. And the purpose of these things is sort of to check the state of the condensing collective understanding about what is going on in the world or what might be going on in the world. Uh, this, it seems to me, is the subject worth talking about. What is going on? How can you find out what is going on? How do you know when you found out? what's going on, can one know what is going on? And uh, my involvement with this is no different from your own. A sincere desire to untangle these questions before the yawning grave closes over the enterprise and the entire thing becomes moot. Uh, one has, you know, a window of opportunity somewhere between zip and a hundred to solve or understand or penetrate or appreciate or come to terms with the conundrum of being, this amazing circumstance in which we find ourselves, both individually and collectively. Collectively, we find ourselves, you know, somewhere between the slime and the archangels, making our way perilously over the millennia, up the evolutionary ladder toward the platonic light or something like that. At least this is the myth of intellectuals uh, of the high-tech industrial democracies evolved over the past 150 years 
the triumphant ascent of organic life toward ever greater complexity. Individually, we each find ourselves born into a culture we had no share in designing, but that we will be expected to inhabit, inculcate, and in fact pass on uh, to our own progeny. And so this is our uh, circumstance, I think, individually and collectively, thrown into being, Heidegger said. Uh, we didn't ask for it. Here it is. What are we to make of it? And obviously, if you toured the halls of this exhibition, uh, we are to make much of it and money of it. Uh, the, these two principles uh, seem to emerge. Uh, that uh, there is much to be said, many ways to slice the pie, and, uh, and the market economy is a very fertile uh, domain in which to thrash this all out. You can sell your answers, you can trade your answers, you can upgrade your answers, uh, you can subscribe, serialize, retrofit, export, import, and uh, reinvent answers. Ultimately, I wonder uh, how satisfying all this is. And I, I'm always amused at my own position in this situation. Uh, I'm it's a great pain to the tolerance of the new age that they keep inviting me back. I'm, I'm sort of like the crazy uncle, or, you know, you, you hope for good behavior, but you understand that uh, uh, it's a gamble. Uh, because I'm very, um, I'm very ambiguous about, uh, about much of the methods and ways by which we do our intellectual business and pursue the matter of, uh, of community and salvation. The, the intellectual tension that seems to work its way through this society almost like fat through meat is the tension between scientific reductionism and the deeply felt intuition of most people that there is a spiritual dimension or a hidden dimension or a transcendental dimension. And of course, downloaded into language, it becomes easily ridiculed. And downloaded into tasteless language, it should be ridiculed. Uh, uh, but so when we try to formulate our spiritual intuitions, they, they are inevitably, I think, tainted by what we bring to it. And I was struck as I moved through the hall. It, it was almost like an exhibition of language types as much as an exhibition of products or, or possibilities. What were being sold were closed systems of jargon, which once opted into tended to produce answers in a short loop of uh, possibilities. All, all uh, closed systems of thought are like this. And to my mind, at the what seems to me very elderly age of 50, and I know to some people in the room it does seem very elderly, and to others I seem a pup, but anyway, uh, from this vantage point, it seems to me that all of these ideologies are uh, cartoon-like. They flatten, they simplify, they betray, they amuse, which is also cartoon-like. And in amusing, I think that this is where their health-fulfilling and uh, salutary worth lies. They are intended to provoke a small smile that smile will uh, lift you a little further up the ladder, the rungs of the ladder of being. So I thought today what I would talk about is some of the conclusions 
that I've come to out of a life of psychedelic voyaging, living inside this insanely contradictory uh, society, and uh, going through the standard moves, marriage, divorce, children, career, controversy, allies, enemies, attorneys, counselors, consultants, accountants, so forth and so on, the same world you live in. What have I, uh, well the first thing I concluded was to try and flee it, um, which I did a pretty good job of by going to Hawaii, which believe me, is a private Idaho. But the, the conclusions that I've reached uh, are not politically correct anywhere. And so I'm very happy to offend everyone because that seemed to be what I did uh, best and there's no sign of mellowing at this point. Uh, so the conclusion that I reach vis-a-vis -vis the individual and uh, civilization is this. Culture is not our friend. Culture is not your friend. It's not my friend. It's a very uncomfortable set of accommodations that have been hammered out over time for the convenience of institutions. A young man gets his first dose of the news that culture is not his friend when uh, told that he's going to be given an air ticket and some training and sent to an exotic country to kill its inhabitants in the name of some political ideal. You have to be fairly dense not to get the message at that point that culture is not your friend. It is using you for its purposes. You would never dream of doing what it now proposes as the only conceivably right and righteous course of action. Well, that's, you know, a black and white, a stark and enormous example of what I'm talking about. But I think every day, in thousands of ways, we betray our impulses toward wholeness, toward community, toward freedom, toward the spirit, by genuflecting uh, to cultural values that are squirrely or toxic or simply wrong-headed or obsolete. Uh, culture is not your friend. It's an illusion. Uh, what kind of an illusion is it? And this sort of leads on to my, the other thing I've come to. It's a childish illusion is the kind of illusion it is. Recently, I had a physical examination with my doctor, and after it was all over, he leaned back in his chair and he said, well, you know, most people your age in the 19th century were dead. Uh, yes, quite true. Uh, people live a great deal longer in the 20th century. And consequently, I think we, uh, part of what drives alienation is it, it's like being, culture is like being taken in a crap game. If you play long enough, you will figure out that you're being screwed. And of course, if you die shortly into the game, it never enters your mind. We are all, uh, some of you may have seen the little saying that hangs behind bars in Minnesota, we get too soon old and too late smart. Well, some of us are getting smart earlier and earlier. And what is seen through to then is the fact that culture victimizes, ideology victimizes. These things are all con games. Reality, a culturally defined reality, is some kind of an intelligence test. And those who are joining are failing the test. Uh, this is very clear to me looking at, uh, well, phenomena like alien abduction and uh, 
uh, the great enthusiasm for conspiracy theory that now seems to attend so much modern thinking. Again, these are epistemological cartoons where low production values made acceptable through tolerance of TV is allowing people to accept uh, material into their own story which should actually end up on the cutting room floor. Uh, everything, nothing, is what it appears to be. Surely you have noticed that. That's, that's A, right? A is nothing is what it appears to be. Well, therefore, complex, difficult, tricky, and mercurial things are even less likely to be what they claim to be than other forms of reality. So, confronted with the endless whispered rumors and doctored photographs and uh, breathless testimony from the denizens of trailer courts and so forth and so on, what is one to make of all that? Well, I think what you're, it's, uh, the message is return to basics. The information matrix has become compromised. The data stream is now suspect. Return to first principles. What are first principles? <laughs> that, that's what the 20th century is trying to figure out. Yes, what are first principles? I'd like to suggest to you that a place to begin is the body. You have one. It isn't ideologically defined. It can be ideologically defined. Uh, you know, in Catholic school, the nuns used to tell us we should dress in darkness so we wouldn't be an occasion of sin to ourselves. Uh, that's an example of the body becoming ideologically uh, defined. But it, it precedes culture. Culture has to deal with the fact that your eyes are on the front of your face and your anal pore is located near your genitals. Culture would probably rather have it some other way. It, it would be so convenient, but hey, it's a given. Uh, I, I'm so happy we don't, our rumps don't swell in estrus the way some of the other primates do. Can you imagine Giorgio Armani uh, trying to create a line of fashion that comes to term with that? But I, but I digress. So the, the body, the body is a pre-cultural given. And coming with the body is this amazing thing which everyone wants to give away, throw away, get away from called the felt moment of immediate experience. The felt moment of immediate experience. This is you, now, here, in your body, with the cheeseburger slowly dissolving, the cup of coffee, the caffeine, the, the, the bladder, all of these things, collisions, concrescences, the crossing of trajectories of mental process, digestive process, metabolism, intent, income, emotional state, the felt presence of immediate experience lodged in the body-mind system in the moment. That's who you are. That's what they can't take away from you. Whether they drag you away to prison, beat you, drug you, whatever they do to you, you will still have some kind of felt presence of experience until you drift into the darkness uh, of non-entity. So there then one can begin to build outward from that core and say, aha, so the stuff of understanding is not information passed by culturally validated coding systems among the primates at high chatter rate. In other words, the truth is not in the public space or the historical space. The space is, the truth is in the felt space of the body in the moment. Well, so some great religions have gotten this far. 
uh, and they, uh, whatever they are, and there are many of them, uh, come at last to advocate something called meditation, which has many guises and travels under many names and methods. But what it primarily is, is attention to attention. Uh, and what it primarily reveals in, um, in the ordinary metabolism is, uh, frankly, bloody little. Uh, good meditators will tell you how incredibly boring it is. And the rhetoric of the religions that have made meditation the centerpiece of their ontology is a rhetoric of nihilism. I mean, this is, you know, oh, I should have said nihilism because this is sort of the, the dirty little secret of Buddhist ontology. It isn't the cheerful new Buddhism being exported from California. It's the old style Nagarjunian Buddhism that says, you know, it is an emptiness within an emptiness, after an emptiness, before an emptiness. This is Nagarjuna on the nature of Bodhi mind. Uh, but, interesting. Uh, meditation pursued not for years or lifetimes, but pursued as a cultural project over centuries, uh, leads not to a clarifying of this philosophical emptiness, but to a discovery that the depths of nihilism, the depths of non-entity are uh, in fact, mult multiferous in their aspects, not a plenum is what I'm grasping for here, not a plenum, not an undivided platonic thing, but an environment of spirit, meaning, power, intentionality, entities, intelligences, levels, swarming, swarming, swarming in the imagination. And these things can be accessed uh, through uh, drugs, through extraordinary physical practices or ordeals, through uh, various kinds of driving of physiological systems like sonic driving through drumming or physiological driving through repeated chanting. And then the ordinary boundaries of culture and of body dissolve into a much larger realm, the imagination. And it is this imagination that I think is the place to put our attention. The imagination is a dimension of non-local information. Quantum physics is now moving towards securing the idea that in some kind of a mathematical superspace, all particles in the universe maintain a kind of super state of connectivity called Bell's non-local connectivity. Uh, what this means to me is that the imagination is uh, literally another dimension, a dimension that is non-local. Now, the mind, uh, the animal mind, the human mind, the paleolithic mind, evolved as a um, master coordinator of sensory data coming into the body from the senses about the level of threat and danger in immediate three-dimensional space. That's the mind's evolutionary function, to preserve the body, to preserve the genetic stream of unfolding by detecting and avoiding threat. And so our minds have evolved in the same way that water takes the shape of its container, our minds have evolved to take the, the shape of three-dimensional space and time under cultural, uh, un under cultural and environmental pressure. Well, we've paid a huge price for this. It probably also has ensured that we're here this afternoon to discuss it. But it's been a long time since the instantaneous reflex to bash the brains out of anything moving near you that's unfamiliar has served us well. 
you know. I mean, that, that got old 12,000 years ago. The entire enterprise of civilization has been about something else. The felt presence nearby, ineffable, unsayable, but uncannily penetrating of beauty, of mathematical connectivity, of supernatural power. And so these are the things, the exploration of which, the singing about of which, make us human beings. The exploration of the universe of the unseen is the business of human beings. It's why we are the way we are. It's why we will be the way we will be. It's how we got where we are. How is it done? It's done by dissolving ordinary cultural boundaries, by perturbing consciousness, and by paying careful attention to the results and attempting to build models therefrom. Now, in the last few thousand years in the West, this enterprise has been tamed by priestcraft which combines the enterprise with judicious politicking and a certain amount of ass-licking. Before that, the enterprise was untainted by such secular concerns. It was full force forward into the unknown. And this is the great era of shamanism. And what is shamanism but philosophy with a hands-on attitude? Philosophy not made around the campfire, but philosophy based on the acquisition of extreme experience. That's how you figure out what the world is, not by bicycling around in the burbs, but by forcing extreme experience. The reason people refer to psychedelic endeavors with the vocabulary of travel, taking a trip, and so on, because, is because that is an extreme endeavor. It's the same endeavor. It's the leaving behind of the values of your own culture. You know, take nothing but a change of clothes, fly to Benares, and take up residence at the Sasamid Ghat among the Charas Sadhus, and I guarantee you, whether you resort to psychedelics or not, uh, you will experience boundary dissolution, a reorienting of categories, and a reframing of your perspective on uh, your life and your being. So extreme experience is the necessary key. This is true in all forms of endeavor. I mean, if you, if you want to understand the atom, you have to smash it. You know, sitting around looking at it, it will never yield its secrets. You have to smash that sucker to bits and then collect the pieces and then examine exactly how it all uh, came apart. In the same way, and without you know, going too far afield for the pun, we must smash ordinary consciousness, get smashed, and then look at the pieces flying in all directions and say, you know, gee, I didn't know minds could do that. Uh, well, uh, they can't in the workaday rote of, you know, living inside the little boxes of positivism and constipated behaviorism and all the rest of it. So extreme experiences. But, you know, you don't want these experiences to be too extreme or you will sever the connectivity among the various subsystems and then we'll have to bury you. And this is always a, a huge strain on those left behind. So uh, there is a practical element here, which is, okay, so we want to have extreme experiences, but we don't want to have such extreme experiences that we don't live to tell the tale. Uh, we want control to some degree over these experiences. Well, this is where the um, incredible thoroughness of our human ancestors comes to our aid. Uh, throughout time and space on this planet, our remote, the tribal societies that preceded us made it their business to discover, catalog, 
and learn to manipulate plants in the environment as the carriers, as the sources of chemical compounds in the environment, which would work extraordinary transformations on consciousness without uh, physical harm, without physiological damage to the organism. Uh, and of all the many techniques, ordeal, abandonment in the wilderness, sexual abstinence, uh, hanging by your pectoral muscles from hooks in the sun for days, uh, all of these sorts of things, of all of these methods, psychedelic plants and their judicious use is arguably uh, the most effective, the, now get that, the most effective and the least invasive and the most likely to uh, produce negative long-term consequences. Well, this was not news or even controversy anywhere in the world until uh, within the confines of the 20th century, basically, uh, the presence of these substances and plants began to alarm the order-keeping forces of the high-tech industrial democracies. An issue separate from the issue of stimulants and depressants, it's an issue separate from the issue of addiction and dependency. These things are not stimulants or depressants and they do not cause addiction or dependency. What they cause is what I'm advocating, a fundamental revaluation of cultural values. Because culture, as we are practicing it currently, uh, is um, causing a lot of pain to a lot of people and animals and ecosystems, none of whom were ever allowed to vote on whether they wanted this process to go in this direction. We do not feel what we are doing. Remember I spoke about the primacy of the felt moment of experience. If we could feel what we are doing, we would stop doing it. But between us and the consequences of our action, there are endless veils of political rhetoric, stultification, denial, uh, uh, sedation, intoxication, ideological delusion. Now, n normally, I, th I think a rap like this tends to, if you have to pigeonhole it, to come down on the uh, side of pessimism. But I am, I am not pessimistic. I see everything as though it were integrated and connected, and there is an unfolding and a plottedness about our situation. It's not for nothing that at the very pinnacle of the age of faith in the machine and science and male dominance and projection of strategic weaponry and so forth and so on, that there should come from the gentler societies of the world, from the rainforests and high deserts of the world, the news of these plants. You know, the Western mind, the cataloging mind, the Cartesian mind in its frenzy to locate, list, isolate, and define everything carried these plants and substances over the past 150 years into the confines of our society, and they are much like Trojan horses left there by the bedraggled, beat-down, uh, uh, disenfranchised, third-world, shamanic people to be found by the white-coated priests and priestesses of science and to be brought back into the laboratory to be picked apart for their efficacy in treating addiction or overcoming neurotic behavior or something like that. But, of course, the neurotic behavior that they uh, impact upon is neurotic behavior so wide, so deep, so revered that it is in fact cultural values themselves. Uh, you see, what is happening, I think, is uh, it's, it's really bigger than psychedelics 
it's bigger than human evolution. We are not making the waves in this ocean. We are, are corks riding the waves of the ocean. But we are uh, privileged by perhaps chance alone to occupy a unique moment in the history of the universe. A moment when the universe goes through some kind of self-transforming, evolutionary, inflationary expansion. That's what's happening. I mean, it's been happening for a long time. It depends on where you pull back to, to get your perspective. One could say, looking at the universe in general, that this planet has been favored from the very beginning. That by a billion years ago, the discerning could tell that this was a planet going places. Uh, but certainly, by 500 million years ago, it was clear that this was a planet going places. Uh, one complex animal life form gave way to another. Uh, catastrophes, yes, but never catastrophes so total that the enterprise was wiped out. We know that 65 million years ago, a catastrophe, an asteroid, a planetesimal impact occurred on this planet. Nothing larger than a chicken walked away from that on this planet. A bad day, you say. <laughs> but were it not for that bad day, uh, our sto we would still be the egg-eating shrews at the edge of the reptilian garden party. Uh, these marvelous flowering plants chock full of psychedelic alkaloids, none of them would have existed. The flowering plants and the higher mammals all arose in the wake of this planet-scouring catastrophe. So, you see, uh, there is a, a built-in to the larger systems of nature, an enormous, uh, what my mentor Eric Yonch used to call, metastability. They are metastable. They are not easily deflected. Uh, an event as large as a planetesimal impact basically only resets the evolutionary clock by a few million years, and then in almost overleaping itself to make up for lost time, out of all of that catastrophe come uh, primates, animals of such complexity and coordinated sensoria that they are uh, wonders to behold, and from them, and quickly, then come uh, abilities never before seen in the world of organic organization, freely commandable languages, spoken languages, symbolic activity for the first time. Well, at that point, you know, even the academics believe human language is less than 40,000 years old. That means it's as artificial as the uh, dirigible or the uh, hypodermic needle. It's an invention of some sort within the confines of human history or at the beginning of human history. Recall in South Africa we have fire pits and stone tools two million years old. Those are not homo sapien tools, but they're the tools of homo habilis, the, 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 the preceding ancestor uh, in the human line. Uh, my point is we are caught up in a process of unfolding complexification that has now lodged in our species. We are its source at this point. At one point, its source was the geology of the planet. At a later point, closer to us in time, its source was all biological diversity. But as the novelty has increased, the domain of its expression has narrowed, and it is now confined largely to the human species. Oh, yes. The rest of nature continues the slow unfolding of continental drift and gene mutation and transfer and so forth. But these things have now receded into the background as the human adventure takes center stage. Uh, so it's almost as though, in fact, this is what I believe, that we are not pushed from behind by the causal unfolding of historical necessity, but that we are 
in the grip of an attractor of some sort which lies ahead of us in time and so we are not as it were following what the statisticians call a random walk across the temporal landscape in fact the temporal landscape is a canyon with incredibly steep walls and we are only free to move within very narrow confines as the the grip uh, almost the morphogenetic intensity of the attractor at the end of time increases its penetration and its hold over our imaginations our uh, city plans our technologies our religious ontologies our medical strategies so forth and so on something is revealing itself to us through us and as we get closer the chatter of noise and static being given off of this thing increases exponentially because you know McLuhan said once he said we move into the future like a person driving who uses only the rear view mirror that's how we understand the future by driving in the rear view mirror all of our models of what lies ahead are based on inverted models of the past and the one thing you can be certain of is that won't do it because we can see a person standing in 1900 using that method would have been wrong about the late 1990s a person standing in 1600 using that method would have been wrong about the late 1900s and so forth and so on you cannot extrapolate from the future into the from the past into the future because the real nature of the future is its being on sich the thing in itself and that's what it's trying to reveal and so the whisperings that reach the ears of the channelers the visions that come through the hands of painters sculptors choreographers musicians uh, uh, all of the felt presence of the invisible world is now incredibly pregnant with this message of transformation and the challenge for each of us is to streamline our language sufficiently that we may mirror this thing in a way that is both true to it and rationally apprehendable to ourselves and this is a, a fractal boundary this is a test of intelligence because the thing in itself cannot be rationally beheld you know the enzymologist JBS Haldane once said he said the world is not only stranger than we suppose it's stranger than we can suppose that to me is a dizzying thought and obviously true so what we want is a model true to the stranger than we can suppose but not so alien that there is no emotional or spiritual support in it for the enterprise of being human how do we do that how do we inculcate the unspeakable mystery of the transcendental object at the end of time with uh, the mundane nexus of real occasions that happens to be our own existence well to my mind the answer is it lies in the ability to assimilate paradox and that means you have to transcend the idea of a closed logical system you have to live with the idea that there is no intellectual closure this is in fact the door marked freedom but you've been taught that it's the door marked uh, madness to live in the light of paradox things cannot be we are taught both a and b simultaneously this is Aristotelian logic a is a uh, this is as old as thought in the West but it has to be overcome and in the felt presence of uh, the moment of immediate experience it is overcome the mystery does not lie far it lies in the immediate moment in the in the act the fact of being the only time we really confront this is uh, in the psychedelic experience or uh, 
other moments of extreme epiphany. Uh, the model that I have uh, come to uh, wrap around all of this, because I think it's simple and straightforward and it leaves plenty of room for people to add their own filigree, uh, is a dimensional model. Uh, God forbid, a mathematical model. But it works something like this. Uh, I mentioned earlier that our senses have evolved as a threat detection device and have sort of crunched us down into three-dimensional space. The shaman, wherever and whenever he or she does their shamanizing, the shaman is a person who is able to transcend the dimensional confines of cultural existence. They, are, they know more than the people they serve. The people they serve are like children within the game of culture. Only the shaman knows that culture is a game. Everyone else takes it seriously. That's how he can do his magic. Uh, I was recently uh, in Australia, and of course Aboriginal culture and shamanism is a topic of great interest down there. And I learned, maybe some of you already knew this, that the term for shaman among English-speaking aboriginals, of whom there are many, some who have spoken it for several hundred years, uh, or over a hundred years anyway, the term for shaman is simply clever fella. And if someone says, I am a clever fella, they are making a professional claim of great weight. But I love that because it's, it says it all, you know, a clever fella. Uh, when I was in the Amazon in my exploring days, we would go up these rivers to these bare-assed folks and to spend time with them. And the people would want to, you know, touch the outboard motors and look at your camera equipment and the butterfly nets and gather around, open faith, totally innocent. You could always tell the shaman, because first of all, he usually didn't come out to see who was there, even though no one ever came, even though these people had visitors once every six months, the guy who wouldn't come out of his hut for the only event in six months was inevitably the shaman. And when you met him, he wasn't interested in your Velcro or your, or your break-apart glow-in-the-dark little trinkets or any of the rest of it. He was looking straight at you through the eyes outside of culture, saying, what kind of a person are you? Are you a fool or are you a clever fellow? What is your measure? How much of this situation do you understand? How many levels are you simultaneously aware of at this moment? And, you know, looking into the eyes of that sort of person, you, you either grow or turn away. You have... Uh, not much choice. So what's happening with the shaman, I think, is he's a hands-on mathematician, a hands-on non-Euclidean geometer. The shaman enters into the quote-unquote